you all for joining the webinar today. Um, I'd like to begin with a, a few housekeeping rules. The presentation slides will be available after the event. Uh, please do feel free to ask questions in the question box. My name is Mark Cottrell. I'm the Global Frank and Technical Director for WSP in the UK. Also with me today is our colleague, Dr. Steve Rogers. Steve works out of the WSP office in Vancouver. He's a principal geoscientist in the Frackman geoscience and mining businesses. The webinar today is on behalf of our team in the WSP Frackman and geoscience modeling business with content being drawn on experience from our own consulting projects and commercial software users in the rock engineering, characterization, analysis and design areas. Um, the objective of today's webinar is to provide a technical presentation of WSP's tool Frackman in respect of using DFN for rock engineering. Next slide, please. This, this slide provides a high level overview of the webinar. We're going to present and put forward an integrated methodology and workflow for the characterization and analysis of naturally fractured rocks. The presentation itself is divided into three key sections. Firstly, we're going to provide an overarching approach and some history. We're also going to bring in some of the, the data requirements and, and the characterization requirements. We're also then going to go into strategies for obtaining key rock mechanical mass properties and the final section is how the DFN approach can be used and can be carried forward to perform insightful geotechnical analysis. Next slide, please. So in this first section, we're going to talk about why DFN. We're going to give a little bit of history. We're going to give some basic philosophy and we're going to look at data. The next slide, please. I want to begin with asking why do we need DFN analysis and modeling? If we consider that developments in fractured rock are becoming ever more challenging, the steps necessary to safely and efficiently work in these environments is not easy. We're frequently faced with issues that rocks and fracture properties are often spatially variable, so we often simplify things. These simplifications and these assumptions are not always ideal for efficiently describing the behavior of the rock mass. These are often highly conservative or highly simplified, but we can do better. We can now describe our rock mass through advances in surface and underground mapping, borehole imaging, borehole technology, and geophysics. The DFN approach can be used to form an ideal basis for using these data, and Frackman is a leading tool for tackling these issues. The next slide, please. Here we want to introduce some of the key reasons or purposes for, for Frackman and the DFN approach. In reality, the rock's geometrical and mechanical properties can be effectively described by statistical distributions. These distributions are frequently used to describe the fracture orientation the fracture intensity, and also the size and length of the fractures. We must recognize that real fractures are not independent of each other. Rather, they are totally dependent on one another. Um, and this is evident in our understanding of fracture intersections and terminations. I'd like to focus on the two pictures, the two groups of pictures on the, on the right-hand side of this slide. The upper group is where the fractures have constant orientation, intensity, and size. This is a kind of house of cards model, which is clearly not geologically realistic. The lower group of pictures is where the fracture parameters are described using statistical distributions for orientation, intensity, and size. This DFN model is much more geologically realistic 
and provides a great vehicle for performing more realistic and reliable rock cap characterization and engineering design. Next slide, please. So the previous slide introduced to us what a simple DFN or discrete fracture network model looks like. This slide provides us with some additional detail on exactly what data is to go into such a model. So the DFN explicitly represents fractures in 3D space. So kind of like 2D discrete cards where we're defining the orientation, the position, the size, and other parameters upon those cards. Um, the pictures on the right provide us an outline of a, of a generic workflow. So beginning at, beginning at step one, we have the site, site investigation. So we have the site data that could be borehole data, mapping data, could also be photogrammetry type data. Step number two, the characterization. This is where we analyze the data to derive the statistical descriptions of the fracture geometry. Step number three, this is where we pull all of the data, all of the parameterized data together and actually build the DFN model. Step number four, application. This is where we take the DFN forward through various workflows from fragmentation to block size analysis, to kinematics and stability. We can also consider things like support systems, as well as feeding into rock property descriptions for conventional numerical tools. The workflow allows us to address several other important aspects of, in this workflow. Firstly, it permits us to generate geologically re realistic descriptions based on data that we obtain from everyday field data. Secondly, the model is stochastic. So we're not, we're not producing a single description. We're producing multiple realizations based upon the same data. So this permits us to produce probabilistic based assessments based on the data that we observe. Next slide, please. Fractured rock masses require us to be able to handle and visualize a wide range of fracture and related data. Here we demonstrate some of the key types. So starting in the, the lower left corner, we have a borehole with some fracture intersections. This type of data straight away tells us about the fracture intensity and orientation of the features that intersect the borehole. Moving to the images above, we can consider the importance of fracture size. So we like to use mapping data. So this could be from an outcrop. It could also be from the inside of a tunnel. Microseismic events from fluid flow injection can also help gauge and constrain the fracture network. The images on the right-hand side show us how we can use photogr photogrammetric data from drones and LIDAR surveys and use this to actually constrain the DFN model. So these data sources allow us to representatively model what we see. The next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of the Fractman software versions we have available from WSP. We routinely deliver and apply these software workflows in the geotechnical, the hydro, the nuclear, and the energy industries. Fractman is the most mature and widely used DFN coded on the marketplace today. It's been commercially available since 1987. Next slide, please. This slide provides just a very brief overview of what the Fragman software looks like. Um, so you'll see a Windows-based application. So the workflows that we set up are easy to access. They're repeatable. We can deal with different types of objects. So you'll see the object tree on the left. On the, left. the display window allows us to not only view the geological framework, of the rock that we're analyzing, but also 
set up and visualize the analyses. So the, the main image, we have some non-planar bedding features and we have different fracture sets um, between, between those beddings. And then we've, we've calculated the block stabilities on, on the bench face. So we generate all of the blocks. And we, can, we can predict their, their kinematic stability, also the direction of any, any displacement of those blocks. Next slide, please. Okay, so on, on this next section, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague Steve Rogers. And Steve's gonna talk about fragmentation, and block sizing, discrete, and discontinuous, and rock mass property prediction. So over to you, Steve. Hi, so good morning, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Vancouver. So it's my morning and Mark's afternoon. It's great to be with you. So just to introduce myself again. So I'm, I work in uh, Golda WSP's kind of mining business. And most of my applications experience has been in both mining and oil and gas applications. I've been responsible for a lot of the workflows that we've developed over the last um, decade or more. Um, so just, uh, just to kick off, just talking a little bit about how we can actually use um, uh, Fratman in fragmentation assessments, something that's very important in a lot of my uh, practice area where we're looking at um, mining and uh, particularly block caving applications. So one thing, as Mark mentioned, with intensity in, um, intensity in DFM models, we actually often use this property called P32, which stands for the fracture area per unit volume. It's a great property uh, because it's a more isotropic intrinsic uh, measurement of fracturing than perhaps a more directionally dependent fracture frequency measure might be. But one of the things we found is that um, actually the, obviously the fragmentation, the, 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 these fragmentation curves are actually are dependent on P32. So you can see, for instance, let's just take a simple DFN model. We can map that into blocks, which we can then turn into a fragmentation curve. Each of these fragmentation curves represents a different P32. So we're actually starting at a low P32 on the right. And as we increase the amount of fracturing, these, these fragmentation curves move to the left as the sizes get smaller. And we can now, we can actually block model that property. So that P32 property, which actually gives us a way to actually be able to spatially predict something about fragmentation within through through the rock mass using these relationships we can develop. So that's a starting point of a lot of characterization processes. Uh, just moving on further in the same in the same way, we can actually visualize these models here. These are a, a kind of five meter squared uh, drift projected onto these models. So in the um, uh, the blue background represents these are large, very, very large volumes blocks. So we the, of the order of a thousand, a thousand meters cubed. And so as the P32 increases as we move to the right, you can see the size of the blocks is diminishing. And we're moving from a highly massive rock mass to perhaps a much more blocky rock mass. This is really important in the in that area of characterization where you know determining what is actually controlling uh, the behavior is very, very important. Uh, and the really, you know, challenging, uh, challenging part of any analysis and, and, and modeling where we have dis a discrete, discrete features controlling that system, whether that's flow or mechanical behavior is, you know, whether we are modeling in a dis in the discrete space or are we modeling in the as a kind of continuum space and fratman has a rich array of tools that help us upscale and integrate both sort of matrix intact properties and the discrete components together in to actually derive these um the kind of upscaled continuum properties so whether that's in terms of flow where fratman can actually compute a, uh, a, a, a permeability tensor based on um, uh, fracture permeability, or whether it's uh, a stiffness tensor, where we can actually take intact materials and fracture stiffnesses and combine that into a uh, uh, that equivalent mechanical model, or even in terms of uh, uh, incorporating the effects of strain and, and um, aperture dilation and, and, and compression and how that actually results in uh, a, a change in material basis. So this is a, you know, you know, 
readily uh, readily used um, sort of day-to-day -day tool that we use in many of our projects. Um, as I as I mentioned earlier, and as Mark introduced, you know, an important part of a lot of the work that we do is in trying to take uh, properties of the of the joint of the jointing system plus intact properties plus spatial variations in uh, and to be able to derive uh, meaningful um, uh, rock mass characterization properties. So, for instance, one. Uh, this formula in the bottom right hand uh, corner shows one application where the uh, the rot mass Young's modulus has been derived um, using this relationship to GSI, the geological strength index. So again, as, as I showed before in terms of fragmentation, for a star we can start to see where we are in this in this space in, ter in terms of uh, massive rot mass or blocky, very blocky, and then by combining also the, the joint properties. Um, we, we can calculate GSI values, and then we can actually use that to actually spatially um, spatially predict those uh, uh, the the kind of rot mass stiffness properties through through that rot mass. Um, so that was just a, a just a little brief overview in terms of the how do we uh, how do we derive some sort of uh, characterization properties uh, from the that the rot mass using using Fratman. I'm now just going to look at a few different applications uh, that we routinely apply Fratman uh, for, both in in mining and and also just more general rock engineering applications. So the first one we're going to touch on is DFN-based kinematic stability assessment. So here we're um, here we're looking at um, some images of Fratman being applied to look at uh, kinematic block stability around around excavations. Now, in conventional analysis, really they're designed to identify the largest uh, possible wedge that can form for a particular geometry. Um, in contrast, what we're doing in the DFN space is to actually identify the the likelihood of blocks of any geometry forming. So it's a it's a truly probabilistic assessment. Um, so what we actually do is we take the underlying properties and we uh, of the, the geometric properties of the fracture system and we generate these these blocks and therefore we we derive probabilities of outcome. Unlike more conventional analysis, which usually impose a number of restrictions in terms of the number of joint sets that can be used, the nature of the excavation. So that really what they're doing is they're actually showing the possibility of blocks forming, not the probability. I call this facetiously a possibilistic analysis. Just these models on the on the right, these are just two realizations of uh, blocks developing around um, uh, an excavation in a mine and, and below, just actually, this is an example from uh, some of our colleagues in Australia who are working on a, uh, a motorway tunnel system. So where, where they've actually um, uh, done all sorts of mapping and characterization work. You know, these traces on the tunnels are showing intersecting structures and then taken into uh, kinematic analysis, which ultimately was also then taken further into um, full 3D uh, discontinuum numerical analysis. Um, as I mentioned, you know the the beauty of the DFN-based kinematic assessment is it makes it's making no assumptions or limitations of 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 the fracture system. So we take our we take our data and we derive our properties, and then we apply it to the geometry as it is. Not it's not it's not reduced down uh, in terms of simplification. Currently, Fratman supports both the inclusion of uh, multiple layers of rock bolting plus shock creating, and it also allows the um, the, the combination with uh, uh, stresses, the, uh, whether they're additional um, additional surface loading or just the stress interaction that's computed within Fratman's finite elements solution. Of course, so that's you know kinematics applied to tunnels, but of course kinematics is a major mechanism in um, in rock slopes and and open pits. Now it's important to actually stress that the actual 
limit equilibrium solution in DFN kinematics is exactly the same that's used in um, more conventional approaches. It's just that the geometry of the fracture system is is more realistic, and with more re with greater realism, we can reduce the conservatism that many people would argue is a fundamental limitation of those methods. So, this um, if we therefore use more realistic uh, descriptions that actually allows us to make our slopes uh, a little bit steeper because the realistic model is giving us a greater reliability in design. Um, these are just some different examples of uh, uh, DFN slope applications to a multi-bench system here in a in a kind of granite mine in the in the north of uh, the north of Canada. As uh, Mark showed you, this this is actually earlier. This is a, a kind of layered system from the sort of Pilbara region of uh, of Western Australia. This is an example where Fratman was actually used for looking at the kinematics associated with a highly faulted uh, major pit in uh, in South America. So the or this pit, this is just the end of it, but the, the pit is about a thousand a thousand meters deep. And, and then this example on the right is then actually using the results of multiple realizations of the DFN model to actually generate these heat maps showing uh, the, the likelihood of, of blocks forming within particular areas of the slope. An exciting part of, uh, of our work um, over the last few years actually has been combining both this DFN analysis with a 3D limit equilibrium solution that actually computes the stability of non-dilating, non-daylighting wedges as well, allowing a, a greater reliability in the inter-ramp design methods that, that we have available to us. Of course, groundwater flow through fractures is fundamentally important in many uh, rock applications and Fratman allows us, um, uh, allows us both the, uh, the modeling of steady state and and transient flow solutions. Obviously, discrete flow, discrete flow solutions are, are critical for relatively smaller scale water management problems where it's really important to avoid those smearing effects that you get from a, a, a continuum, a, a continuum process. A good example would be to think about perhaps a fracture that was giving um, 30 litres a second of flow into a tunnel might actually be represented by something of the order of 0.1 litre per second averaged over a kilometre of drift. You know, one of those solutions is useful for picking, uh, picking a pump at the small scale and the other one maybe at the much larger scale of the scale of a, a large mine or an excavation but not a local problem. So. These are just some uh, other examples shown where we've simulated um, both fresh uh, uh, flow or pressure within fractures in the and the, the bottom is actually looking at simulated fluid pressure through a slope. So trying to understand why certain um, pore pressures are observed. And again, because they're driven by fractures, they're driven by the connection of the fractures. And so they help to help the client in this case to, uh, to understand why we're seeing certain variations. Um, and an obvious extension of this flow related work actually is the application of um, of a DFN analysis to to grouting where well, obviously grouting is about trying to get the, the grout or the paste to flow into the in the right places and using using Fratman the DFN approach helps you to understand the distribution of aperture potential choke points within the system so you can actually design effective systems for delivering grout out into into the rock mass it's a technique that Golda were, and uh, WSP were very instrumental in um, d developing was what's called the uh, aperture controlled grouting method which is a, a is um, established to improve designs, to improve efficiency and improve confidence um, in terms of how we actually grout, grout the rot mass. Just got a little example here actually from a, a grout wall application. So there was available uh, uh, orientation data, um, fracture orientation data, mapping data that gave us some size, some um, uh, packer test data that gave us transmissivity distributions that we could use to build up this DFN model. Now, if we consider 
three rounds of uh, of grouting. We have the uh, in the the reds, the primary holes, the blue are the secondary holes, and then the green are tertiary holes. We can actually look at what that means in terms of uh, grouting and the reduction of permeability. So here, this is looking straight through the um, straight through the grout curtain. So after one round of holes, you can still see there's still considerable area that's not yet been penetrated by grout. After a second, the secondary holes, you can still see. And again, after the tertiary holes. So it just gives you an understanding how that the effective grouting of the system is a complicated problem and needs considerable thought and analysis. And this is one of the areas where Fratman helps us achieve much better outcomes. Um, then just, you know, this is an example from a, a, a nuclear repository project where, you know, data from uh, a very rich uh, array of, of tunnels and pits and shafts was taken to build up an extensive characterization of the geological, hydrogeological and mechanical properties of that rut mass that was ultimately developed into a DFN description where they were interested in changes in permeability and, and, uh, and consequential flow that would happen that would happen through through time. So Fratman was actually used to simulate changes in stress that were developing um, through changes in ice loading. And then those changes in stress were applied to the fractures and, and um, using a, cu a coupling system that actually allowed the change in hydraulic properties to be uh, coupled to those, those stresses. And so you actually understand how the flow would evolve through you know, geological time. And I'm just going to hand over for the last few minutes back to Mark and an interesting project that he was involved with. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So, so this uh, this slide here is um, you know where, where we're taking you know, take, taking workflows, take, taking processes in, in Fratman that we've applied here on Earth, and you know applying applying these to denied locations. So planetary geotechnics so can, can we use satellite acquired data to build a build a fracture model um, remotely and the, the bottom of the slide sort of shows the shows the rough workflow um, the on the right hand side there we can, we can see a, a little a little model realization that we've built so you know, these types of workflows, these types of models can be used to feed directly into groundwater flow or fluid 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 flow through ice, um, also geotechnical stability. And the, you know, the reason we're doing this is you know, we want to remotely evaluate you know, are there other conditions that could be suitable for life, um, suitable for inhabitation um, in, in the future. So with, with that, can we move to the next slide? Okay, so just, just to wrap up and um, the conclusions and, and the why. So why is DFN so good? And you know, what is it that other tools and other workflows cannot do? With, with DFN and with Fragman, we provide a more robust means of leveraging and integrating your site characterization data. Um, the, way we, the way we bring the data together, it permits us to develop a basis for more reliable engineering design. Um, it adds realism. It also allows you to more easily communicate the understandings of the model through powerful visualizations. And the, the final point, management of uncertainty. We're not pinning our design on a, on a single realization. The workflow is based upon taking multiple realizations and probabilizing the likelihood of a certain outcome and the impact of that outcome. Um, so thank you very much. Um, can we move to the the next slide, please. So thank you very much. There, there are contact details for both Steve and myself. Um, there's also the, the, the Frackman email address. Um, 
Can we open the floor to questions, please? Thank you, Steve and Mark, for a fantastic presentation. So just uh, the housekeeping items again, you can log uh, your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform, and also a PDF version of this presentation is available to download in the handout box. I will start with the first question. How does Frackman address uncertainty in its model approach? Okay, um, I, I guess just picking on picking up from my, my words a few moments ago. So we're the DFN model is is based upon you know, it's based upon sort of statistical descriptions of key properties. So the intensity, the orientation, the size, and you know we're, we're generating multiple realizations based upon those st statistical distributions. So with that, we end up producing maybe a hundred, you know, a hundred realizations of the same model that are statistically identical or statistically similar. And if if we get ninety, you know, ninety-five realizations out of a hundred show us that you know a certain part of the model is going to behave in a certain way, we can, you know, we can take some level of certainty. Out, out of those predictions. Okay. Thank you. Um, what is the meaning of calculating the FOS of non-daylighting wedge? Okay, let me take this one. So obviously, yeah, in a, in a non-daylighting wedge, it's not a true simple kinematic problem. However, this is why we've been combining the DFN approach with a, a 3D limit equilibrium solution. So effectively, we're computing the, the probability of failure of a wedge that would invine, involve a, the combination of shearing on, uh, shearing on structures plus an element of rock mass failure. So we, we have to evaluate both, both of those failure mechanisms simultaneously. So that's really how we're calculating the probability of failure. It's this combined kinematic and, and kind of rock mass failure. Thank you. Another question for you, Steve. Can you provide more details about the finite element solver that you mentioned? Um, actually, I'm going to pass that one to Mark. Yeah, uh, the, so the, the finite element solver in, in FRACMAN is it's a it's a fully implicit 3D solver. Um, it has fully anisotropic elasticity. Um, we are we are including a standard plasticity plasticity model. So um, it, it'll probably be sort of a either a more Coulomb um, and, and maybe also a you know a hook brain type envelope. Um, so. As I said, it's a, it's a 3D solution. It works with hexahedra. It works with tetrahedra, tetrahedral type elements. Um, all of the standard types of loadings, um, you know, pressure, displacement. Um, it it doesn't have to be conformal with the DFN. So um, the there is coupling between the DFN and the sort of finite element based matrix so um as, as steve touched on for, for the grain water flow we can have coupling where the, the the stress in the matrix directly influences the the aperture and and permeability of the fracture system um hopefully that's that's enough detail thank you um, another question. Thanks for the presentation. Just to clarify, does Fragment perform uh, stress strain, for example, elastoplastic analysis and seepage flow analysis, or just creates the DFNs, which will be later fed into other software for stress strains and flow analysis? Okay. So um, I, I suppose just just leading from the from the previous comments, uh, full anisotropic elasticity, yes. Um, elastoplasticity is coming. Um, seepage. So the, the the flow side of things, we have a finite volume based flow simulator um, wired into Frackman that, that allows us to not only solve for flow and transport on the on the DFN, but also in the matrix. Um, so you can certainly 
do do most of the analyses. We, you know, we generally seek inside FRACMAN. That said, you can you, you can certainly export the, the rock mass description. You know, you can export that out into various other formats um, to, to use in other tools. Likewise, the DFN, you can export that out as a as a as a GoCAD surface or as a DXF for, for use in other tools. Thank you. Um, how does FRACMAN deal with slope stability problems that are not necessarily kinematically controlled, for example, stress controlled? Um, let me take that one. Well, if it's if it's uh, if it's a, a rock mass strength ultimately controlled slope, then then Fratman isn't isn't the tool. You would probably use a you'd ha you'd be forced to use some large three D numerical analysis, um, or in fact the the common analysis method in the in the mining industry would actually be two D limit equilibrium solutions. Um, you know, really Fratman Fratman is used for either where it's a kinematic problem or as i said we've been coupling it with a uh, a, a kind of a kind of in-house 3d limit equilibrium solution to to uh, assess that combination of a structural component and a, and a kind of rock mass component but um, if it's just a rock mass component then really it's not a it's not a fracture problem per se and so I, I would solve that problem myself using a code like Flack 3D, perhaps, for instance. Fantastic, thank you. Could you give an example of a possible wedge identified through the traditional unwedge uh, analysis? Uh, the question is, uh, this wedge was identified to be too controversial, uh, not like the realism by Frackman. I hope I understood the question and already read it correctly. Um, Okay, well, okay, I'll I'll answer the question. I think it is. So, in um in say um unwedge um analysis, you're um you're selecting three joint sets, and unwedge um really is identifying the largest uh, wedge that could say uh, develop on the back of a drift. Um, so it's not actually it's not saying. It's not saying that that block will form. It's saying that is the largest block that kind of can form. So, for instance, there are actually some simulations once that we did in Fratman where we try to evaluate the probability of the occurrence of an unwedge scale um, block. It worked out it was something of the order of once every two and a half kilometers. So that just brings us to a a, a, and a really important philosophical question about, you know, what should we be designing for? Obviously, in underground, we have to be very, very safe. But, you know, should we should we be designing for things that happen very, very, very infrequently, or should we do de de developing at a you know at a slightly different level, but perhaps have um, you know, a, a better way of investigating ahead of ourselves, um, so that we're not we're not ever putting anyone in harm's way, but really we're designing for the rock mass kind of as it is, as opposed to what it might possibly be. Thank you. Um, additional question was, uh, what is the confidence level of the statistical model uh, with the generated wedges? Uh, I uh, well, I guess you could that's you could pick the confidence level you wanted to operate at so for instance you could if you ran thousands of realizations you could choose your confidence limits or perhaps the question is how confident are we in the um in the wedges that are generated in which case i'll have to say that is a function of the quality of the data that goes in and the analysis and the kind of the design of the the analysis method so it's it's not as simple as it's the ninety five it is ninety five percent. But uh... thank you for clarif clarifying this. Uh, I, I will move to the next question. Is it currently possible to export the rock mass model into a DEM software? Yes, it is. Nice, nice, easy question. Yeah, we we can export. You know, we can export the DFN. We can export the 
the geomechanically upscaled rock mass properties um, in various formats um, for, for a wide variety of tools. Thank you. Um, if rock matrix plasticity is not included, how can the stability of a slope with non-daylighting blocks be, anal be analyzed? Um, I, I guess it comes down to this, is the inclusion of um, taking the, the rock matrix and evaluating its stability through a 3D linear equilibrium solution. So it's not directly within Fratman, but that's how we're evaluating it using a, a, a custom slip surface identification process, which identifies how, how um, uh, a failure surface may develop through the, through the, mate, the, rock, the rock matrix and then evaluating its probability of failure. Thank you. Um, next question is, what is the minimum amount of data, data that is required to use the Fragman? Uh, min minimum, minimum amount of data, um, I would say, you know, a good borehole plus some, some mapping or photogrammetry is a, is a, is a really good starting point. Um, you know, you can get a, you can get an awful lot of, you can get an awful long way with a, with a borehole that has some televiewer data, um, where you have, they have problems is things like fracture size. Um, you have no way of, you know, no way of seeing size on, on a, on, a, on an image log. So the mapping data, you know, the map, mapping data is, is, is really a good, good way of constraining that, that sort of uncertain parameter. Actually, Mark, can I just jump in here? I think it's, yeah. it's, it's really important to understand that obviously when you have a little data, you have, uh, you know, high uncertainty, but obviously modeling allows us to make some assumptions. So we can almost be driven by what I would call conceptual push. We've got some kind of concept, some geological concept, and we're, we're going to, um, maybe we'll say, okay, as Mark said, maybe we've got a borehole, we've got some orientation, but we're not sure about size. So we could test, uh, what if we had short, medium or long, um, structures so we we can sort of test those and maybe bracket the problem and obviously as a as a project develops and the amount the amount and the richness of the data improves we kind of move from that early kind of conceptual push to what i would call sort of data pull where we're working much harder to ensure that our, our characterization and our geometry of that of that developed dfn model becomes more and more accurate and so because we're being we're trying to honor more and more data so that's like the data pool so um so i think you know like you said we we can start with a little but we supplement this, the, the little amount of data by some strong use of sensitivities to just identify what is in what is important and what is less important and that actually helps drive our data acquisition process because it allows us to target the properties that are really important. Fantastic, thank you. I will take the last question. Are discontinu discontinuities in sedimentary rock such as bedding, laminations and structures in shell considered in the FN? Uh, yeah, um, cer certainly things like uh, bedding features, um, they, they are very important, and um, they they land, you know, they lend themselves to to the DFN approach, um, just as a you know, just as a as a regular subvertical fracture set um, would. So, you know, if we can if we can characterize those bedding features in terms of their, their orientation, um, you know, if they if they follow a structure, um, we we can we can vary the the orientation of the bedding spatially. Um, we can also include the, the 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 impact on the rock mass stiffness from those bedding features. So, um, you know, if we have a, a laminated shale, for example, um, the the stiffness, the Young's modulus um, in the directions sort of parallel to those bedding features is quite a bit higher to the to the Young's modulus and stiffness perpendicular. So, so we can include we can include all of those features in 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 the description. Um, so th there's no issue. 
Fantastic, thank you. So we are at the end of our webinar session. Uh, please feel free to follow up directly with, with Mark or Steve via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining today. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Mark and Steve, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you.